All right, hello and welcome back. I'm Eric Sunset, your host of the Doc Buddy Journal. Here at Doc Buddy, we deliver healthcare solutions that take the pain and costs out of broken workflows, like with our OpNote solution, which gives ASCs the power of instantly generated operative reports approved from the point of care. You can learn more about OpNote and our whole portfolio of solutions at docbuddy.com. And today we've got a special guest. We're joined by Shauna Alfano, who is Director of Operations for Mavericks Health. She's also the president of Inzio Consulting. Shauna has over 20 years combined experience in business and in nursing. Shauna has experienced an unprecedented amount of diversity, growth, and change in evidence-based practices and in culture. Shauna has also worked in acute environments as charge nurse, as well as surgical and sub-acute environments. Shauna, that's quite the read-in. Thanks for joining us today. Very welcome. We're glad to have you here. Oh, it's our absolutely our pleasure. And if um, if that intro didn't cover it, what else should our listeners know about you? Oh, I think that said it pretty well. Um, definitely a uh, varied background for sure um, to land where I'm sitting today, um, but a lot of good experiences along the way to bring into the SE industry. So happy to be here. Well, we're really excited to get your your insight and your expertise, and you um, you really can speak to it all. You you recently changed jobs from the administrator and director of nursing for a very busy California surgery center, and now you are director of operations at Mavericks Health. Like, how is that different? What are you doing today? Yeah, definitely different. Um, so today, my world looks. Um, a lot different in that, you know, um, my past life involved day in, day out on the clinical floor, meeting with the surgeons, dealing directly with the surgeons every single day, um, managing clinical emergencies that they took place, uh, managing full teams of employees um, on the day-to-day -day basis, to um, now I am overseeing several operations in terms of being the resource for the administrators and the clinical directors on the floor for the uh, teams of staff where I am not the uh, first line of defense, if you will, um, but instead, again, guiding the leaders who are leading those teams, as well as um, working in the background on the operational piece, making sure that all things are working together um, in unison from revenue cycle to um, you know clinical compliance to just overall operations, uh, business office, all of those things. So um, it is definitely a new and exciting challenge. Well, those uh, groups who uh, have your oversight are certainly lucky to have you. Um, Thank you. One of, uh, one of the reasons we're together today is you were quoted back at the end of last year, maybe, or the turn of this year in, so. in, in Becker's ASC. And we'll spare the listeners uh, kind of our drawn out story to finally get to record together. Uh, but it, yeah, it, busy year. Busy year. Um, and, yeah. And it, it's centered around as 2023 comes to a close on, on Becker's ASC, and we'll of course have a link to that, uh, to that article in the show notes, but it, it centered around potential changes that payers are making that can impact the bottom line of consumers. And obviously with the ASC, you know, achieving to the greatest extent possible in U.S. healthcare, that triple aim of alignment between patient, provider, and payer. Payer is a big part of that equation. Um, what kind of predictions were in that article? Are they coming true? Has anything changed? Yeah, you know, um, what I had said last year was, I think one of your biggest challenges going into the new fiscal year across the board, especially in the ASC realm, is not knowing what the final rule is going to be, right? Um, when Medicare is looking at what are we going to take out? What procedures aren't we going to allow into the ASC? What are we not going to pay for? What are we going to add to the ASC? Um, you know, it's it's very difficult when you're um, the person responsible for planning the business, the plan itself, right? Um, and you're trying to appropriately align for the year to come, you know, your staffing, your resources, your um, operational plan. If, you know, let's say your bread and butter, um, if all of a sudden they change, you know, they're not going to pay for two out of three types of hernia repairs, which, you know, has happened. Um, but they're going to pay for an appendectomy that they previously wouldn't allow in an ASC. Um, what does that look like? You know, what are the rates? Did they reduce rates? And they do that often. Um, did they completely take something off of uh, your, your fee schedule for Medicare Part B? Um, People don't realize maybe in the day-to-day -day operation if they're not heavily involved in that, but it does affect 
all levels of operation because obviously your revenue is going to be hit. Um, that ties to your supply and demand and what you can and cannot bring into a center. You know, it affects whether you can grow uh, and continue to recruit and retain physicians, all of those things. So I would say, yes, some of that did happen. Um, you know, we did see changes in various areas of, um, you know, payments and, and those types of things, um, you know, and, and those things are definitely affecting centers as costs continue to rise um, in general across the board. You hit the nail on the head there, obviously. A lot of pressure on the surgery center to do more with potentially less than it's than it's ever had. Yes. Um, again, payers are a part of this triple aim, patient, provider, and, and payer. Um, it doesn't seem like reimbursements are going up, and especially in a zero offset budget item like Medicare, somebody is going to have to give if the ASC is going to take. So there's a, a universe, yeah. a whole galaxy of issues out there. What do, you, what do you do about it? Yeah, I mean, you just work harder, which is hard, right? Um, it, it creates a lot of obvious other issues as well because there's burnout involved in an example. Um, Medicare is inclusive for your implant reimbursement. We all know that. Your um, ortho cases, you know, your scopes, your, your things um, that are basic, no problem. As you get into meniscectomies and total joints and these um, providers of these systems that you need and these implantables continue to charge more and more and more, you know, um, you have to be all over your implant costs and reimbursement. You have to be all over as an administrator, your negotiations directly with those vendors. You can't allow necessarily the vendors to come in and communicate directly to your OR staff, which is what they will undoubtedly try to do. Um, you have to be on top of and have your thumb on every little thing when it comes to those costs, because those are your insurmountable costs that will make or break a center. To be honest, you know, if, if you're not all over um, your implant logs, for example, and as part of your revenue cycle process, you're not going to notice that they quoted you at $4,900 for a total joint um, system. And at the end of the day, you get the invoicing, a PO is created for 7,500 and you're questioning what happened. Oh, somebody dropped this on the floor and we had to open a new XYZ. Um, you know, all of those things, right? That's an example of cost containment and how hard we're having to work to be all over it. And that is just one tiny little area. It doesn't um, even get into all of the different and other specialties, you know, and what is involved, you know, in everything that, that comes with that. So work harder at the ASC level. And, and we know all of our folks in ASCs are, 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 are working hard. There's, there's layers to it though. Uh, there's what you can control right there in front of you and you got to do the best you can there, but there's some things that are maybe slightly less in control and groups like ASCA are, are advocating on behalf of ASCs nationally every day of the year um, to improve the economic conditions of ASCs. Before we started to record, we were talking about the macro pressures, you know, from the payer into all of, all of healthcare really. So if you, if you had a magic wand and obviously work harder doesn't fix legislative issues, but if you had a magic wand, where do you think you'd start to uh, improve that economic climate? I would continue to um, go after accountability. I would continue to wholeheartedly and, and willingly take part in audits. And I've, I've been part of those, you know, where um, Medicare is coming in and they're saying, hey, we want to see the books. We want to see what you're doing in this specialty. Um, and we want to see what the physicians were doing in this specialty. We see you have a high volume of X, Y, Z. Um, and I think that's important because it keeps everyone above board, right? Um, we should be doing the right things when it comes to billing. And we should make sure that when our audits come back and there's a question on something that doesn't align, okay, if it doesn't align and we don't have the documentation to prove why it should align, then we don't get paid for it. Um, that is not how you want to operate your business, but it's an honest um, checks and balance system. And I think that it should apply to the physicians. And I think that the insurance company should also have to be accountable. Um, and I think that transparency and accountability is where the future is for the success of ASCs. And it needs to be that we are all, we being, um, you know, these uh, supportive groups such as CASA in our state, ASCA, as we all know, the administrators on the ground level, you know, um, we need to have physician champions who are about the patient and the best care possible for them. We all have to collectively as a group work to make these things happen. Well, I think that's important too. Um, 
listeners of the show will know I've got somewhat of a background in, in revenue cycle, not to the extent that you do, having to actually uh, you know administer and operate uh, a facility, but payers and providers are, are at odds. It seems like it's cats and dogs. And it, in my opinion, it ought to be a little more collaborative. Yep. I agree. Um, you know, they don't always see eye to eye, right? Um, and a physician will oftentimes come with valid knowledge, expertise, experience about and surrounding, you know, a code, for example, that in their minds for the um, principle of, let's say, the science behind the procedure that they're doing, right, the actual anatomy and the structure, um, it, it isn't that they don't have a valid point. It's just that on the flip side of that, the payer is looking at it from a very black and white viewpoint, um, not having that in-depth knowledge. And it's just an example of where I see it fall off all the time. It's, you know, no, we're going to deny this because X, Y, Z and the surgeon's going back and forth with them. You know, they've done peer to peer. I've been on those calls and they just can't align. And it's something so minuscule, like just something so, um, avoidable in my opinion, or um, easily solved that those are the types of frictions we can't have in the industry. If we're going to fix this system, you know, um, I could see where if there's such a clear and concrete difference in something where, you know, a physician may be clearly trying to pull something under the rug, that's different. Um, but I, I don't see that a lot of the times they see these, these very minuscule little tiny things where they'll flat out deny a patient healthcare because they're not going to approve a procedure because it's not within their black and white description of what they feel to be the accurate code indicator. And, and that is just, there's gotta be some give and take. And again, it's just one small example, but it is something that I see all the time. Well, and that, uh, that friction leads to physician burnout, you know, universally across the yeah. board, obviously. And, you know, to, to point it back towards, uh, back towards the ASC, there's staff burnout too. You know, we've heard over the course, really since COVID, uh, but particularly over yeah. the course of the last 18 months, can't retain staff, can't make a hire. I just need a warm body. And that's obviously a gross oversimplification, but I can't even do that. So what, what are you yeah. seeing happening now? Are things getting better, worse, staying the same in terms of uh, the staffing shortage impact in the industry? I don't want to be negative, Nancy, but I can't say that the staffing situation has gotten a whole lot better since COVID. There was a definite shift in, it seems like, mentality in terms of what uh, employees are looking for. You know, we get a lot of requests for, and this is not only clinical as a nurse, but this is, you know, hiring business office staff, support staff. Um, you get a lot of requests for remote positions, which I do understand, you know, there's um, a balance to be had, but in, in some circumstances, especially clinical, for example, a nurse that's in the clinical component or um, area of her career can't be remote because we need hands-on patient care, right? So um, that's a really difficult one. And um, the trade-off in saying, no, we can't allow you to be remote, um, we need you here in person, tends to be then, for example, someone will come back with, well, if I'm going to actually be coming in, I want X, Y, Z rate. And these rates that we're, we're seeing uh, being requested are just astronomical, which it's unbelievable to me. Um, or, you know, people aren't staying um, in places. It seems as though they're kind of job hopping a lot more than I've ever seen in the industry. Um, it's just a really weird place, if you will. Um, and, and I've never seen anything. It's unprecedented to be in this, this time we're in. Um, so, so it's a little bit concerning. Uh, the concerns, real, valid, you know, shared across the board from all the administrators that we speak to. And on, on the flip side yeah. of that, you know, maybe on the positive side, if you've got a positive hat to put on some of the, some of the tactics around retaining good staff, obviously pay is important. And what we hear from yeah. other administrators is if, if you just want the pay, then I can't do it for you. The hospital will pay you more than I yeah. ever could. But there's a culture component to this too. Maybe a little bit less of a cog in the machine yes. at the surgery center. So for our for ASC administrators uh, listening uh, to the show, what are some pro tips you would have around generating a really positive culture where maybe you absolutely know, it's important? You know, that's why we're working. Obviously, with the Powerball, maybe there's a discussion to be had, but um, there's more. Yeah. Than that. Yeah, it's it's funny you bring that up. I'm actually working on a platform right now for um, some some 
insight into successful leadership because I was blessed to have, for the better part of the last seven years at least, a lot of the same staff. Um, and the one thing that um, you know I made sure they always felt was autonomous. Um, I felt like it was really important for me to give them um, self empowerment, if that makes sense. Um, if they needed help, it wasn't a delegation. It was I'm going to jump in and help you. If they were struggling to the best of my ability, I would balance uh, my workload with, I'm going to struggle with you. Um, if they had ideas, it wasn't always just a no. It was, let me hear what you are saying. Let me understand the concept behind your thought. Um, let's look at it and dissect, will this work? Let's give it a try. Um, you know, being accountable for my actions. If I make a mistake, owning it. Um, being transparent. If I don't know something, owning that and letting people know, I don't know, I'm going to find out or we're going to find out together. Um, when a process isn't working, instead of complaining, it's going through it and figuring out how do you fix it? And if you can't fix it, who can we bring in to help us fix it? Um, I feel like all of those mentalities combined, um, and this isn't to toot my horn, I was working with fantastic people and I've been blessed in my career to work with a lot of fantastic people in general, but I just feel like if you are authentic and transparent, um, honesty is encompassed in those things, in my opinion. Uh, you are able to draw and retain people that are aligned with you and that will that will be willing, even if they're not 100 percent aligned to jump in and try because they see you doing the same thing. You're not just delegating, but you're actually one of the team. It's, it's interesting that that's your, your response. We didn't go over this before uh, pushing record. But when you look at all of the physician and nurse burnout reporting and there's there's a lot of it. And that's one of the top yeah. factors across the board, no matter who yeah. you're looking at. It's around it's around autonomy and then alignment with organization leadership. So did you know that? It's yeah. a great answer. No, I th thank you. No, it's just how I lead. So um, that's something that's really important to me. And, and that's probably the one thing that I miss the most in moving on. Um, as much as I love my new position, I miss my colleagues because, you know, I, I love leadership. So. Well, that's, it actually offers up a really nice segue for me, too, because in addition to lack of autonomy and lack of organizational alignment leading to burnout, one of the other factors is kind of a new frontier for the ASC. And in these burnout reports, just to have a complete thought, the technology that physicians and healthcare teams are forced to use is also a huge driver of their burnout. And that's not new. Yeah. To anybody. No. Um, but the ASC, obviously not a part of the High Tech Act. There's no meaningful use for ASCs for better or worse. And I, I do think there was some good there, especially on the patient side. At the healthcare side, you know, I saw it first or second hand, maybe not so great for practices yeah. and, and those that have to use it. Um, but you're you're seeing now that ASCs are digitizing their records. You know, everybody's got a practice management system. Yeah. Some have EHRs, not very many from the folks that we talk to, but what are you seeing? What are some of the best practices and reasons, I guess, to, to digitize your ASC? You know, I can speak directly to the days of having a file room and doing your absolute best in a busy clinical setting that um, to have your nurse staff, you know, at the end of the day, hey, we're going to audit these charts and we're going to get all of this done. And, you know, that's a great thought, right? When you're doing 450, 500 cases a month, routinely, 12 months a year, um, that is not realistic. It's extremely challenging. Fighting the physician signature fight every day gets exhausting. Um, and equally as such, anytime I've been, you know, in a hospital where, where we went from at a county level on um, paper charting to Cerner. That was a huge undertaking. I was part of the super user team there. A lot of us have worked with Epic. Um, ASCs generally aren't working with those big powerhouse hospital systems, um, but they are bringing in, like you say, um, these other EHR practice management um, software. And so uh, actually in our center, you know, in, in California, we, we did transition in 2021 to an EHR system. Um, and we knew what was going to happen. You know, we built a great team of super users. We pulled people from every aspect of the ASC so we would have that insight. We walked through months of um, prepping and, you know, item masters, putting them in place and getting medication databases built. We all played a critical role in it. Um, and we knew D-Day was going to be the day we rolled out, which I will never forget, September 13th, 2021, um, because we knew that was the day that the physicians and anesthesiologists, physicians, everyone across the board, we were going to hear it from them. And we did. And we planned it. Um, 
for about two months, we knew. Uh, and what I thought was, okay, you know what we need? We need to hire some sort of administrative assistant, you know, that can stand in the pre-op area and every single day walk each physician through the how you log on, this how you log on, this how you log on. Oh, this is what you click. This is what you do. So we went through that routine for literally two months. And the shortened end of the story is at the end of the day, you know, fast forward three years later, no longer do we have piles of files sitting on the floor, you know, out of compliance. Uh, that same admin person that helped transition those physicians into this system or is the same person that continued on doing the auditing because now it's all electronic. Um, you know, a lot of these systems and softwares offer, um, you know, a to do or a, um, what do you call it? Uh, you know, basically they log in and they have their little to do folio when they get in and it's like, Hey, you didn't finish these three charts. And it's very simple for them to go in and go, Oh yeah. And sign off, click, 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 you're done. So now our compliance goes from 22% to 85% in the matter of 12 months, you know, I think it's fantastic in that regard. I think if you are, um, detail oriented and consistent in the process, it will pay off tenfold for the center. Um, you know, it, it made so many things um, connected as with like the hospitals and how they, you know, want things to be synonymous and easier for us to gain access to as medical professionals. And that's exactly what it did. I mean, the anesthesia no longer had to print out their logs at the end of the day and take them to some billing office. You know, now we could give um, HIPAA compliant access to a billing team, which gave them just billing print information that was necessary to do the billing. So all of those things were a hundred percent improvement. And I am a hundred percent a supporter of that. Well, and even going back to your September 13th, 2021 D day, that still is seemingly in the minority, you know, it depends who you ask, but EHR penetration into the ASC is, uh, it's not a majority right now. So yeah. The question I have yeah. for you is how much longer can facilities operate on paper in a meaningful way? I mean, you, can you, yeah. yeah. Should you? Yeah. I mean, that's the thing is to be honest, continuity of care, all of the things, right. There's so many changing components. Now there's so many, like I said before, there's so many patients that are coming over to the ASC environment that are ASA level two and bordering on three, you know, which is not great for ASC and, traditionally, but as long as those can be safely done and they are reviewed appropriately, um, I think it's necessary because we need to be more connected now than ever because we need to be able to get into multi-platforms and pull information quickly. We need to not be relying on paper to, you know, to write things out and to have to go back and search a file to find something. I mean, I think that as um, the acuity level and sicker patients are coming into the outpatient industry, um, we really need to be prepared for that. Um, you know, simple things such as a transfer, God forbid, if someone has an emergency situation in the past, um, we had to fill out, you know, 10 pages of paper while we were, the ambulance is en route to the center, if you have a transfer happening actively. And when you switch over to an EHR management system, you know, immediately now you have this transfer set that you can print that's pulling all of your collective data from your charting that you've already done. And it prints out in a matter of 10 seconds and you're ready to roll. Now you can give a report. You can focus on what's important. You're not using nursing staff to fill out paperwork while you're trying to manage an emergency situation. So it's very, very important. Yeah, that, that's the common gripe on the practice side was that it's dragging down physician productivity. But when you look at the patient safety side, the throughput through to your revenue cycle from a visit to reimbursement, you know, those things are it's just not possible without software. And at the end of the day, the continuity of care, I'm telling you from starting pre-op to the minute they roll out of PACU, everything is there. Um, I think what people dread the most, Eric, honestly, is just the implementation phase and dealing with the surgeons. And it is hard. Don't let me fool you. It's hard. You just have to stay the fight and you have to be consistent and you have to plan for it. Wise words. I have nothing to add there. <laughs> yeah. Let's, it's not fun. Let's pivot over to the hottest topic in healthcare, bar none. We've hit some of the big ones, reimbursements, uh, staff shortages, physician burnout. So those are pretty hot topics, but they don't hold the candle to AI in healthcare. What are you seeing? What are your thoughts? Open-ended. I'm torn on this topic, honestly. Um, you know, I'm not against it per se. I know that it's still a new um, concept in, in the relative term new, I guess, right? Um, 
you know, but things such as AI and RCM, because I'm hearing a lot about that right now. I know people in that market. Um, and I think while it's 100% a great concept, does AI really do what the brain does at the end of the day? Is it going to touch on every single point necessary, right, to make sure that I'm not seeing appeals coming into my inbox at a high level? Um, how is it really connecting that up, right? I, I'm not... Um, I'm not against it. I'm just still in that skeptic phase of how do we translate that over into the healthcare industry. Now, quite honestly, in a lot of areas, I do think that they're um, they're making some significant headway. You know, in in terms of things like diagnosing, um, you know, via video and AI. I mean, detecting symptoms of emergency situations, stroke victims, all of those things. I think it's going to be very critical and helpful data. Um, at some level in the future, but do I think that we can 100% just replace the human mind in a lot of aspects, which, you know, in a lot of ways is the goal in some areas, not necessarily, um, because you'll never create compassion and, um, complex thought process and true, um, critical thinking in my opinion, um, with AI platform. But, but again, that's just me. Um, I think as more and more information comes out, it will be very useful in a lot of arenas, but maybe not all. Yeah, I think you're right. And you kind of hit on a dog whistle for me. First of all, with the name of it, artificial intelligence and healthcare, yeah. more like machine learning and predictive analytics and healthcare would be a more fair way uh, to frame it. And there's also, uh, to your other point, it doesn't mean the same thing to everybody. Like, what are we talking about? A revenue cycle workflow? Or are we talking about diagnosing things or something that we talked about before recording? You know, nursing is the engine of healthcare, hands on with patients, yeah. ensuring everybody is getting what they need and everybody's safe. Can AI do that? Yeah. No. I mean, I, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, no matter what we do, if someone rolls into the emergency room, we're not going to turn on a computer and, and have it, you know, be able to deal with the family that's losing a loved one or, you know, um, jump in and, and give critical medications at a time of need, you know, necessarily. Um, I think it has a long way to go is what I should say. Right. And again, I just don't think it's ever going to be able to be the human mind. Um, but I will say again, I think it does have a lot of useful, um, implementations, if you will, and, and maybe those will um, make themselves known over time. And, and then the things that maybe we shouldn't be looking to AI for will also make themselves known, if you will. Yeah, we're I think we're really aligned on that. We're still at the very beginning of this process. It will shake out. There'll be some for sure yeah. great applications. And very rarely am I one to uh, hope for legislation really of any kind. Uh, but this is still the Wild West. Uh, there are Virtual yeah. zero consumer yeah. AI privacy and protection laws, let alone patient. So that's going to guide a lot of this as we get further into this decade. And, you know, we'll see. There will be some very good uses for AI in healthcare, undoubtedly. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Well, Shauna, uh, that's, a, that's a pretty good run at it there. Uh, where can our listeners connect with you online? Any social medias or things like that? Yeah, so I'm working on my social media presence right now um, as a consultant because I do help um, a lot of different companies in other areas of um, nursing and the surgical industry. So um, ba basically the best way to reach me would be to email me at shauna at nzogroup.com. Um, and my company is I-N-Z-I-O group.com. We'll be sure that uh, makes it to the show notes. And anything else you'd want to share with the audience that you're they're working on, what you're up to, what's exciting in your world? Yeah, I'm um, actually working on a um, digital media platform right now. I'm going through the process of that uh, with the team. And we're going to um, talk a lot about my consulting services there just because um, I feel like I'm very passionate about building teams in the surgical center um, environment. So that's something I really like to help centers with, as well as um, accreditation and compliance. I want to make sure that our centers are as safe as possible. So that's something that I'm often called on to help a lot with. 
Um, and so that platform is going to be a tool to use uh, to get in touch with me for those types of projects when needed. Um, and I'm also going to be also offering some leadership courses on the platform as well. So I'll have to stay in touch with you, Eric, and get that information to you as it comes out. Yeah, it'd be our pleasure to have you back on and talk about it when it's live. And Absolutely. We'll be, uh, happy to help you promote that. That would be awesome. Cool. Well, Shauna, thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Anytime. And on behalf of the entire Doc Buddy team, thank you for listening. Be sure you're subscribed on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube so you can always get the newest episodes of the show. And until next time, I'm your host, Eric. We'll talk to you again soon. Bye.